Christmas with them. Last year, they came up to me and said, are you coming to the dinner? I said, you know the rules here. I took the pledge. I won't be at the table. They said, it's going to be all vegan. So, you know, I was able to successfully... I, I know it's counterintuitive because we're hurting animals. Humans are hurting animals. We want to be socially conform. We want to conform with society's desires. We want to fit in. But if we can find that extra energy and that extra specialness about what it is to take a stand against something that's really critical and important to us, we can actually make change, radical change, by being one person that says, no, this is wrong, and I'm going to take a stand. And it doesn't mean you're going to be mean, or you're going to be violent, or you're going to be an angry vegan. It's just, this is the, these are the lines, and we have to make changes. So, you know, taking the Liberation Pledge, fully supported by ALA. So both Ananda and I have personally seen the power bearing witness and the change that it has over people, but I guess a personal story for me was the first time I went out to bear witness. I'd made the decision to go vegetarian when I was 12 years old, and when I went out for the first time, I think I was 17 or 18, um, I'd never been around other vegans, and the moment I looked into that truck after talking to people there, I automatically went vegan. Because I always say to people, you know, when you're watching it on a screen, you're not connecting with that being, but when you're there in person and you actually see a being on that truck that you can't help without legal consequence in that moment, it changes you, it sparks a fire in you, it makes you look into yourself and you're like, what can I do to help people see this? We invite everyone to come out with us, it doesn't matter if you're vegan or vegetarian. And I don't mean to discredit the work that we do online because our social media posts have reached hundreds of thousands of people. And even my 55-year-old Italian father who used to kill animals is now vegan from the power of our videos. I think the same movement is very effective because we're able to reach so many people and people are able to go and bear witness and take on the duties themselves. Um, so especially seeing the growth of the like organization, even just within the last year, is amazing with over 230 save groups and groups just popping up every single day. And I think it's also um, a testament to how important the same movement is with how we're able to go to different areas now and to tables. So when we're on Warp Tour and at music festivals, we have kids who come up to us who are super interested in what we're doing and want to go bear witness and want to go start their groups. And we're able to work with musicians as well. So we have people here that are working on a vegan music documentary that's working with artists that are vegan and that are promoting that message. So it's just showing how effective it is when people go and they're able to do something themselves and they're able to go and bear witness themselves and make that connection. Thank you. Um, from, my, from my experiences, um, for the last year I've been active, I have been trying to figure out how to m measure our success because uh, animals are still being used and exploited. So uh, I've struggled with this question. I've given it a lot of thought. Um, so I'm kind of looking at it more from a personal standpoint. And at this point, I can't liberate every animal, non-human animal, but I can liberate myself. Um, so I continue to look at the, uh, the successes that I've, I've made. Uh, I previously struggled with mental health issues and, uh, and past violence. I did an interview with CBC Radio recently where uh, they were questioning me on uh, the impact of the violence that I, I did in the industry and how that affected my personal life. Uh, and it, it definitely did. There was a, a constant, there was a conditioning there. I was being uh, paid on a daily basis uh, to be violent without even considering it that way. So once I left that industry, uh, you know, this, the, the violence, the thoughts, the, the aggression is still inside. So uh, working on myself, I think, is the only way I can personally measure at this point, uh, other than looking through other people's outreach and, and the successes that they've had. Uh, the first time I went to bear witness, uh, admittedly, I was at home. I'd watched footage online, uh, you know, using moral judgments, you know, thoughts like, well, maybe they're just sensitive people. First time I bear witness, I wept uncontrollably. I, I had killed these animals. I had been aggressive and violent to these animals for a very long time. And, and to be able to identify that well, we don't always need to remain the same way that we always were, and we can make a, each individual one of us can make an impact. 
Uh, I've also gotten a lot of uh, feedback from former Slaughterhouse employees that have been messaging me privately. Uh, are you the Scott that did this interview? I'm like, yes. And, and, oh, this is, this is what I used to do. This is, this is where I'm at now. And, and some are doing well. Some are still struggling. Uh, so I think that's the most way I, I can account for the uh, effectiveness of it is that former employees are also coming out and speaking as well. Thanks, everyone. Um, okay, so I guess the best way that I've been able to judge whether my approach has been effective, well, first of all, I'll tell you how I came onto my approach. So I used to look up to the people before me who paved the way, other educators who did speeches and educated about veganism. And some of the ones who I really looked up to had much more of an aggressive kind of approach than what really suited me as a person, just wasn't who I am. But I tried it anyway because I thought, who's the most effective people that I've seen do this? Okay, what did they do? Okay, I'll do it like that. And it just wasn't working for me, you know? I just thought, man, this is, this is like banging my head against a brick wall. I wish this was easier. I thought, you know, it seems like it should be easier. All the logic's there, all the truth's there. And then one day I was telling my friend about it and she said, why are you doing it like that? I said, what do you mean? She goes, it's not you. Why don't you just do it like you, man? Why don't you just be you? You know, you're a loving, compassionate person. And I explained, well, because these people have done it like this and they've had such great success. And she said, yeah, but they've already got that style covered. Why don't you just do your style and see what happens? And she said, I think it could be better. And that just gave me the, wow, it could be better? Maybe. I mean, worth a try. Let's just try and then I hung up that phone and I went into, at the time I was, try, I was just getting back into personal training after the year of silence because I needed some money to be able to travel and do the speeches. And I go into the office and I sit down and someone comes up to me and says, here's, um, you know, do you want this muffin? We've got a spare muffin. And before I would have answered a little more aggressively, a little more condescendingly and a little bit more agitated probably, just like the people that I used to look up to. But because I just had this conversation, I responded in a different way. I said, I appreciate the offer and you know, if that was a vegan brownie, I'd love it because I do eat brownies, but I just don't eat these brownies filled with the products of violence and cruelty. You know, do you know what happens for the products like butter and dairy and eggs to be in here? No, nah, I don't know. So I said, oh, you know, all right, well, let me tell you. And five minutes later, there's a group of them huddled around the, the laptop and they're watching my YouTube vids. And I'm looking at them like, oh, my God. And I send a photo. It's got them in there and it's got the cup, the muffin there. And I send it to my friend. I'm like, holy shit, it works, man. And since then, I just, I just kept with it, right? Just educating from a place of love and compassion. Love and compassion. And, and the other people I started looking up to were people more like Dr. Martin Luther King and Gandhi who had non-violent, peaceful approaches. That's mainly what they, were, um, what they were using. And the biggest success that I've seen from my own personal approach is when one of my videos went viral. It got over 12 million views. And it was just me telling my story. No blood and guts, no anger, no aggression, no blame and shame, no judgment. It was just me sharing and encouraging better behavior. And 12 million views later, the person who shared that, which was on the largest animal rights page on Facebook, which has, I think it's got about, last time I checked, maybe it was 6 million likes on their page. They share videos and post constantly. And it's, it's the biggest page on Facebook for animal rights. It's called Best Video You Will Ever See. And the person who runs the page, they said to me, James, this video that we've shared, without a doubt, has influenced more people to go vegan than anything else we've ever shared. And I was like, wow. No blood and guts, no blame and shame, just me educating, encouraging, and telling my story. And the reason why I think it was so effective is because I was... I was coming from that good place and people didn't get on the defensive straight away or, or jump on the hate train straight away or pick me apart, pick the messenger apart, which was their reason to not listen to the message. You know, I spoke to them with respect and compassion and understanding and patience. I told my story, I encouraged better behavior and according to the person who runs that page, it influenced more people to go vegan than any other video that's ever been shared. So that's how I know that that approach works. If for no one else, it definitely works for me. Fantastic.
Awesome story. Okay. We're about 15 minutes left, and I want to get some questions from you guys. So who's got their hand up back there? It was the first one. So I'll come over, I promise. So introduce yourself and ask whoever you want to ask. Okay, hi, my name's Sarah. Um, I don't know if, I think this is maybe just a question to everyone on the panel. Um, it was, I was just informed recently, actually at Thanksgiving, by my grandmother that um, in London, we have a geese problem, of course, and not a lot of people like the geese in London, but uh, my grandmother said that they are spraying the geese eggs and killing the geese eggs. Uh, or they're planning, about, planning on doing this, I think, in Springbank. And um, I guess my question is, like, what should we do about this? And is there an approach to deal with some, like, this type of overpopulation of a certain species in, um, like, a city? Uh, just maybe looking for advice or your opinion on this? About what I can do or what we all can do? <laughs> Anybody want to take that? Jason. Thanks, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's, that's a tough issue, right? Um, first of all, you know, you can work on your, is it your grandmother, right? Yeah, I would suggest working on your grandmother to help her understand speciesism a little better uh, so that she can clearly see why this is a problem, right? Um, we always like to, um, humans have this idea that, um, that we're superior, right? That's a basic premise of speciesism. And that uh, we have a right to determine uh, who uh, is determined to be overpopulated and who isn't. I tend to think humans tend to be overpopulated, but we're not in interested in controlling that. What we're looking at here is um, human privilege, essentially. Um, it's one thing that a lot of animal, um, like a lot of people in society don't actually consider that you know, we like to talk about intersectionalism and stuff like that, but not a lot of people are talking about the most powerful point of privilege that we have, and that's your human privilege. We like to talk about white male privilege, we like to talk about uh, economic privilege, but ultimately, every single person in this room is never gonna have to worry about somebody deciding that they need to be offed because they're overpopulated. We, already just because we're born human have this huge amount of privilege the geese don't necessarily have a lot of privilege first of all they're not born human so these maybe you could explain this to your mother or that or your grandmother about a little bit about human privilege and that there really isn't a geese problem there's a problem of humans over over uh, stating their position on the planet and and uh, creating a problem for geese by assuming that their, their lives are less, they matter less than, uh, than humans. So that, that's ultimately the problem. Um, but what we can actually do um, is uh, you, can, you can call and talk to your uh, local um, um, ward members and, and talk to them about that. Uh, ALA tries to always have a presence in the community uh, in the gallery whenever animal rights issues are a matter. Right now, a larger issue is the backyard chicken issue. Uh, London Council likes to be little Toronto, so every time Toronto does something, like Toronto just initiated a, a plan for allowing backyard chickens to have, uh, like a pilot project to go ahead. So this has always been a taboo issue for London. But now they're, now they're seriously considering it, and you can consider it, it's going to happen. But ALA is up there in the gallery. So if this ever becomes an issue before council, you can go up there in the gallery, and they do look at the signs. They do pay attention to what people are saying. You can mention it directly to your ward member, uh, you, who is your direct representative of council. Um, but ultimately, uh, unless you're willing to get down to uh, the nitty gritty and trying to go out there and stand between the sprayer and the eggs. I mean, that would be a very powerful direct action uh, method of disrupting the idea that those geese uh, don't deserve to live. 
just because they're a nuisance to humans. Um, but ultimately, the best thing that we can do is try to get people to understand their human privilege and uh, denounce speciesism everywhere we go. And the more, and the more people we get that take a position against speciesism and go vegan, then ultimately, you know, these things will 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 be shunned and and not looked upon as as uh, morally uh, appropriate to do. So we got a long way to go before we get there. Ultimately, our largest role right now is trying to um, end uh, the 70 billion animals that are enslaved and, and slaughtered for, for food purposes. But if you take the abolitionist perspective and you take um, the position against speciesism, then essentially you can cut down the tree of oppression. Um, ALA takes the idea that uh, what, what's, what basically is the underlying problem is that uh, all oppression comes from speciesism. The World, World Peace Diet, written by Will Tuttle, is a very powerful uh, book, and I would encourage people to read that to understand oppression and how we can uh, eliminate uh, that sort of thing through um, uh, taking a non-speciesist approach. Thank you very much. Okay, we're, we're, I want to get a couple more questions in. So let's try to get these answers in two minutes or less, please. Hi, my name's Gillian. I just want to thank you all for being here and just mention that I think it's really wonderful that you all have different approaches because there are so many different kinds of people in the world that uh, we can reach with different approaches. So it's, it's fantastic that you all are all working together. Um, so I'm pretty vocal with my friends and family about what I believe and I ask my friends and family a lot of questions about why they do the things they do, and I, I try to understand where they're coming from and what their thought process is. And I have a lot of compassionate and loving friends and family, but there's also people that it, does, it seems like no matter how much you explain to them or how many answers you give them, um, they're not terrible people, but they still don't care. So I'm kind of curious how you guys would approach these people that might be your friends or your family that you're giving this great information to, but they still want to turn away from the topic and they still don't seem to care. So. Great question. Um, I'm friends with Casey Taft, who's a clinical psychologist who I'm gonna give a plug to his book, uh, Vegan Advocacy. In my opinion, it's the best book on vegan advocacy. And when it comes to learning vegan advocacy, watching James in action and listening to his stories, hugely powerful. Everyone kind of agrees, you figure out where the person is and you bring them up. And when people think about vegan advocacy, I am a huge supporter of people learning how to be a good vegan advocate. If you do a Cuba Truth and you go out there and try to explain to people why they should be vegan, you're gonna get some practice on how to do it. You watch James, you're going to learn how to do it. You do a disruption with DXC, you're not going to learn how to do vegan advocacy. I mean, we, don't, we hold a spot that's not the vegan advocacy spot. But I do vegan advocacy. I do the cube, I do personal advocacy. I do personal advocacy at work. Um, so yeah, it is a skill that needs to be developed and learned and there's resources available. Um, which is different than building a social justice movement and trying to change the world. So we need both. So I just want to just add that part. A lot of people think DXC is against vegan advocacy, and we're not. It's hugely important. Say the name of that book again. Uh, it's uh, written by Casey Taft. He's a clinical psychologist. And the name of the book is? Motivational Methods for Vegan All Activism. Right. Or something Thank like you. That. Something like that. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I, awesome. I totally... I think that's just such a good point because DXC, yeah, it's not vegan activism. They're, they've got this, it's based on science of social justice movements and I don't really understand it, but I trust that they know what they're doing because they put so much time and energy into researching it and their method seems to be working. When I first saw it, sorry, this is a bit off topic, but just interesting. When I first saw it, what they were doing, I was like, oh my God, the world, the world is not ready for this, guys. But you made them ready, you know, it made them ready and it just pushed it forward and I thought, great, whether, too bad, let's not wait for them to be ready, let's force them to 
like, let's put this issue on the table. I thought that was really cool. Side note. Okay, so particular, uh, back to your question about how to reach these friends and family who are good people who just don't seem to want to change no matter what you tell them. My opinion is that, yeah, they're good people and there's probably just some sticking point that they've got. Maybe they don't think it's healthy. They're not convinced on the health argument. Maybe they're not convinced that there is anything wrong with being someone who buys free-range and humanely slaughtered animal products because they've been taught that that's fine. Maybe they're not convinced that they will enjoy any of the food and they think, how could I do it? I'm just going to fail anyway. Maybe they don't think it's cheap and they, they can't afford it. There's something there. There's some sort of sticking point. So my advice always when you're talking to people is find this person's objection. And there might be numerous objections. So work with them one by one. They don't think it's delicious. You just, here's a delicious vegan recipe. I made it for you. Or here's one you can make. Or here's just a photo of 50 of them on my Instagram. Look how delicious they are. Don't tell me you wouldn't enjoy this. They don't think it's affordable. Look how much cheaper my grocery bills are these days. Here's a book called Eat Vegan on $4 a day. Look how cheap the vegan foods in the supermarket are. They're the cheapest ones in the supermarket. So basically it's just, what is your objection? Find the person's objection. And when you, and when you understand, because they might not even know what it is yet either. But when you really get into it with them, just go, okay, you're a good person. You don't hate animals. So it's not that you just hate animals and want them to die. So what is it? Do you not think it's delicious? Do you not think it's easy? Do you not think it's healthy? Do you not think, like, what is it? And find it. And it'll be different for everybody, but we've all had them. And then when you find out what it is, you can work with showing them the truth of the matter and handle that objection and cross it off their list. And then maybe they'll go vegan or maybe they got more objections. Work with the next objection and the next and the next. Everybody's different. So that's your job to find out what it is and then to enlighten them to the reality. Okay, sadly, we're out of time. I know we could do this all day. <laughs> But we got other speakers coming up. So I want to say thank you so much uh, to everybody on the panel. Thank you so much for coming out. I know it went by so fast. Um, you guys, I believe Glenn has some lovely gifts for you guys. I know these guys will be around. I'm not going to say come up and talk to them uh, and, and bother them, but I'm sure they'll be around uh, and they might be able to answer some of your questions. But bef please, a huge round of applause. Tom DeCash, Jason King. Mariah and Ananda, Scott and James Aspie, they're out there doing great work. You guys are too, so thank you so much for your support. Thanks, man. Oh, my God. Well Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marty. That was great, you guys. Can you, can you just hand everybody their bag as we walk by? All right, everybody. Uh, that was pretty awesome. Um, one more time, big shout out and thanks and kudos to this uh, great panel to this great day, to this great event. Uh, I don't know, but I think this veganism thing might catch on. I just think it's about to happen. Uh, 15 minutes, we've got Gene Bauer here from Farm Sanctuary. It's gonna be awesome. Go grab a bite to eat. Say hi to some vendors. Come on back. See you soon, thanks. <laughs>